Welcome to Madame Podcast. Today's special guest is Dr. Mitri Rahab. He's a president and founder of Dar al Kalima University. He's also a speaker and a public theologian. In this episode, he discusses his newest book, Decolonizing Palestine. He also shares Christian Zionism, settler colonialism, biblical interpretation, and so much more. Please stay tuned. During the season of Advent, the church has long invited us to pray for the coming of God. These prayers help us anticipate the celebration of Christ's coming, but that is not all. To learn more, please join Homebrew Christianity's new online class, The Cosmic Christ. This is a pop-up learning community hosted by Drs. Philip Clayton, Diana Butler-Bass, and Trip Fuller. This class will explore the complexity of the Christmas story and the vision of the Cosmic Christ today. This class begins December 4th, so please sign up today at www.tripfuller.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Bright Stars of Bethlehem. Bright Stars' mission is to raise awareness and support for Dar al Kalima University, the first and only university of arts and culture in all of Palestine. DAC educates 600 students annually at two campuses, the main campus in Bethlehem and the satellite campus in Gaza. Tourism makes up 70% of Bethlehem's economy, which is currently frozen during the war. This drastically affects the Dar al Kalima University students and their families. Help Bright Stars provide tuition for their 600 students by donating at www.brightstarsbethlehem.com. Orbis Books is happy to sponsor this episode with Dr. Mitri Rahab. Orbis Books is offering a special 30% off Dr. Mitri's book, Decolonizing Palestine, to all Madame podcast listeners. Please use discount code MAD. Please visit www. Dot orbisbooks.com. One of our wonderful sponsors is Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, a progressive, spiritually centered servant ministry that seeks to form courageous leaders in the way of Jesus to cultivate communities of justice, compassion, and hope. Garrett offers degree programs in different areas of church and nonprofit leadership, including a Master of Divinity. Master's Degree in Counseling, Educational Leadership, Public Ministry and Theology, Doctor of Ministry, and a Doctor of Philosophy. If you want to take the next step in your education, you can study in person or online at Garrett. Apply to one of our Master Degree programs before February 1st, and you could be eligible to receive one of our highest valued scholarship. Visit G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash Madame. That's G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash Madame. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madamepodcast.gmail.com. This is Madame. An outdoor living room for guests to share their experiences and their work. I invite you to come in and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang Podcast. Today's special guest is Dr. Mitri Rahab, who is the founder and president of Dar al Kalima University in Bethlehem, Palestine. Rahab is the most widely published Palestinian theologian to date, including his Orbis books, Faith, Faith in the Face of Empire, with Suzanne Henderson, The Cross and Context. He received a 2017 Tolerance Ring Award from the European Academy of Arts and Sciences, the 2015 Olaf Palim Prize, and the 2012 German Media Prize, just to name a few. He holds a doctorate in theology from Phillips University in Germany and an honorary doctorate from Concordia University in Chicago. It's such a pleasure and honor to have Dr. Rahab back on Madame Podcast today to talk about his latest book, Decolonizing Palestine, 
the land, the people, and the Bible. Dr. Me Dr. Miguel de la Torre wrote, decolonizing Palestine decolonizes my mind by raising my consciousness to show how my understanding of the so-called Holy Land weaponizes the Bible against the people of the land. A must read for all of us Christians in the West who wish to stand in solidarity with the oppressed. So Dr. Mitri Rehab, it's such a pleasure to have you back. I wish I had you back in better circumstances. You know, I just returned from your fabulous conference at your university. And then for this happening, I am in so much pain, you know, heart wrench every day when I open up the news. Before we get into the book, can you just share with us how you are, your family and your university? Yeah, thank you, Grace, and good to be with you again. Uh, it was a pleasure to see you here in Bethlehem uh, in person, uh, yes. together with Elizabeth. That was really uh, great to spend some time together. Uh, we are okay, but uh, the situation is crazy. Uh, I mean, Bethlehem is besieged. We cannot uh, leave Bethlehem with our cars. Um, uh, our students cannot reach the university because it's very dangerous for them to travel from one city to the other because the Jewish settlers are attacking Palestinians uh, on the roads, uh, in the cars, uh, uh, and uh, 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 the, the main worry is about Gaza. Uh, I mean, we have staff, faculty, and students there. We already lost uh, four volunteers who were killed in Israeli airstrike. These are creative young Palestinian artists, uh, three females and one male. Uh, two of them were killed with the whole family, I mean, everyone uh, in, in airstrike. Uh, so far in Gaza, uh, over 10,000 people, uh, Palestinians, uh, were uh, murdered by airstrike and over 30,000 people injured. Uh, Israel attacked uh, a church, uh, 31 mosques, over 200 schools, 24 hospitals. Uh, one of them is the uh, Baptist or, or Episcopal hospital there. Uh, uh, the state of the art uh, uh, Arab Orthodox Cultural Center uh, that was just inaugurated uh, six months ago, uh, uh, $16 million building uh, was uh, destroyed in just seconds. Um, I mean, the number of uh, uh, children and women are those who suffer the most. Uh, they make uh, two thirds of the casualties um, and of the injured people. Uh, there are uh, 1,200 kids that lost their both parents. Uh, I mean, it's devastating. Uh, the, the number of bombs that Israel uh, uh, dropped on Gaza in one month uh, equals the number of uh, bombs uh, the U.S. Uh, dropped on Afghanistan in one year. Uh, the American soldiers, uh, they had like... Uh, uh, they had uh, like some constraints. Uh, th uh, the constraint said, uh, you can kill 30 uh, civilians if you know you will kill one uh, Afghani militant. For Israel, it's 1,000. You can kill 1,000 civilians if you want to kill one Hamas people. So you can see the devastation uh, that is happening uh, so, so that is really where our hearts uh, and minds are, uh, and this is why we call for an immediate ceasefire, uh, for an open and sustainable humanitarian corridor, and for a just and lasting peace uh, uh, with self-determinations for the Palestinians. It's heartbreaking um, listening to the number of deaths and what is actually happening in Gaza. You know, there are people um, in the West who are denying the number of deaths, which is mind boggling to me when we can see what is happening in real time. 
Um, it's not like 50 years ago where you couldn't see things happening, but you know, people there are reporting and telling us, and it is devastating to hear. Um, I can't imagine that happening to my own people and that it's happening to your people. It is um, heart wrenching. So I'm really thankful that you can take the time to come on Madang podcast to share what is happening there. And of course, your important book published by Orbis uh, Books called Decolonizing Palestine. I personally read it really quickly because I felt it is such an important, you know, Miguel de la Torre, who endorsed your book, said it's a must read. For me, it's a must read. I wish every uh, person in the West can read it to really understand the issue in Palestine. So, um, you know, I'm grateful that me and my daughter got to visit your hometown city. So can you say a little bit about Bethlehem? You do talk about it in your book. So I myself live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but you actually live in real Bethlehem. So tell us about your city. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, the little town of Bethlehem, uh, that people in the US uh, will sing about in uh, like two months from now. Um, and they think it's maybe a mythical, magical city. It's a real city. And by the way, it's not located in Israel. It's located in Palestine. Um, this is where half of the Palestinian Christian community in the West Bank lives. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, actually a city with a long, a uh, long tradition. Um, the city is over 4,000 years old. Um, and um, it used to be a, a Christian town uh, to 90%. Uh, but uh, today, uh, Christians make uh, between 30 to 40% uh, of the city. Um, it's a Palestinian city, uh, Christian and Muslim live there, but it is surrounded by 22 uh, Jewish uh, colonies or settlement that uh, have stolen 86% uh, of our land, of the Bethlehem land. So we have only 14% of our land uh, for our use, and the city cannot expand because Israel uh, built a wall on three sides uh, of the city, so the city cannot expand, we cannot start new neighborhood, um, and uh, yeah, basically we are, uh, I mean, a city that cannot expand uh, is doomed uh, uh, to, to die. Um, uh, Bethlehem to 70%, uh, the economy uh, depends on tourism. And you can imagine now with the war, uh, you know, uh, when you were here, just imagine, a month ago, we couldn't put all uh, participants in one hotel because all hotels uh, were uh, actually overbooked. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, imagine all the hotels are empty. Uh, they closed uh, and they sent their workers home. Uh, the restaurants are also mainly closed uh, and people are uh, afraid in spending any money because they know for one and a half years they are not going to have income. It's so sad. And so the wall that is there, um, you know, many of us see it as apartheid. So can you say a little bit about that? Because there's many in the West who will deny it. But we know Jimmy Carter had talked about it and other UN people um, in the UN have talked about it. So can you um, share us? I've seen that wall too. Um, so can you share us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I know uh, some people deny it. I remember uh, once uh, uh, going to the uh, Hill to talk to uh, members of Congress and uh, one member said, no, 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 it's not a wall, there is a fence. I said, no, it's, it's a concrete wall that is 25 foot high and 500 miles long. Uh, he couldn't believe. He said, no, no, the Israeli were here and they told me, no, it's a fence and they can move it any time. I said, this is not true. Thanks God, I had uh, pictures with me, uh, A4 pictures, 
that I took them out of my uh, uh, bag and showed it to, to him. Uh, he was shocked because, yeah, the Israeli propaganda is, uh, you know, there is a fence. And this, uh, this uh, wall has nothing to do with security. We saw it now in this war that actually walls do not give security. Uh, this wall is about land grab. I know that in the States there is the debate about the wall with the Mexican border. Uh, and I was there, I saw it firsthand. But here, it's a land grab. Uh, imagine if the U.S. will go deep into uh, Mexico uh, until Mexico City and take all the land and then build the wall there. This is what Israel uh, has done. And so, uh, uh, and this is an, uh, really an apartheid wall because uh, the Israeli government, they don't want their citizens to see Palestinians. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were all the time trying to uh, to work as if we don't exist, uh, as if there is no uh, Palestinian issue. Um, and I think uh, what this war showed is that, you know, you can have peace with the Gulf states, uh, the so-called Abraham Accord, which has nothing to do with peace, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a capitalist economic enterprise, um, but now actually everything that Netanyahu uh, was marketing, and he's a salesperson, he's an American salesperson. Uh, everything he was doing actually collapsed. Uh, he neglected uh, the track, uh, peace track with the Palestinians, went to the Emirates. Uh, and now that is collapsing. Uh, he was marketing that Israel is, uh, uh, can teach uh, the whole world about security. And unfortunately, uh, the U.S. contracted uh, Israeli uh, companies to train their police, uh, including those who killed, uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, in, in uh, George Floyd and others. Uh, they were trained by Israeli uh, companies. Uh, and now also that uh, uh, blew up in his face. Uh, uh, and he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's a walking dead now. Uh, so, uh, you know, so the, the wall uh, meant actually for Israeli to forget that there are, there is another people sharing the land and these people have a right to self-determination to life and dignity and to freedom and to pursue of happiness these are the american values that we are uh, asking for as palestinians nothing more and nothing less mm -hmm. yeah your book um, dealt a lot with the Bible, which was so fascinating to me, how we have misinterpreted or misused it. And at one point in the in your book, you say, you know, no one dared to cite the Bible to justify colonialism in Australia or here in North America. But today, many Christians and Jews are doing exactly that uh, for nearly 200 years, continuing to do this. Um, very day in Palestine. So why is this happening? And why are we in the West so silent and letting it happen? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Um, I think there are uh, several answers to that. Uh, one of them has to do with this uh, uh, um, corrupt biblical interpretation yeah. where people were quoting uh, the Israel of the Bible with the Israel of today. Uh, and this is uh, deeply entrenched in the minds of many Christians. I mean, you know, these poor people who sit in on Sunday morning in the pew and listen to a passage about Israel, and then they go back home in the evening, they turn the TV on, and then they hear Netanyahu uh, uh, talking about Israel and about Joshua. He thinks he's, he's the modern uh, day Joshua, you know, who is who was asked by God to kill everyone in Gaza. Uh, I mean, uh, people 
you know, are naive. And so the Bible uh, is being weaponized against us. That is one. Mm -hmm. But secondly, uh, uh, you have the guilt issue where, uh, I mean, Europeans, but also Americans felt guilt because of the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, they want to, uh, you know, remake it now, unfortunately, on our expense. Uh, so, uh, so that is the, the bad conscious uh, uh, is another, it's the second thing. The third thing is that uh, the U.S. and many of these European countries uh, are uh, countries that were built on uh, settler colonialism. And the book really focuses on settler colonialism. I mean, you know, uh, these Europeans who fled Europe for persecution or other things, they came to the U.S. They believe the U.S. is the promised land. This is the new land, uh, the new Canaan. Um, and uh, they, with the doctrine of discovery, uh, they uh, believed, and unfortunately, this was given to them by the Pope at that time, uh, the green light, uh, you go and, uh, you know, the native people, the Native Americans, uh, have, uh, you know, uh, only two choices. Uh, either they surrender and become Christians, uh, or they have to die. Uh, and, you know, millions of Native Americans were killed. Uh, and their land was uh, appropriated. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this sits so deep, this settler colonial mindset sits so deep uh, in, the, in the minds of, uh, of people in North America. Uh, uh, and so subconsciously, they see, when they look at Israel, they see themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the point. That's a very important point because Israel is a settler colonial state. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to tell you, to show you uh, the the uh, the blind spot in all of this, you saw that in my book. Um, uh, I try to uh, to attack in a nice way uh, one of the. Uh, modern uh, prophets in the mm -hmm. theological American landscape, uh, which is uh, Walter Brueggemann. You did a great uh, job. <laughs> uh, who, who, read, who wrote uh, a good book on uh, land. Uh, and I asked myself, how can somebody who is really liberal, sophisticated, critical mind, how can he write a book about land in North America without talking about the original sin. You know, the original sin is really what happens to the Native American. And the second deadly sins was what happened to the African American. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third, what happened to Asian American, and so on and so on. But really, the, the original sin was what happened to the Native American. And how can he not see that and not address it, especially that he is saying that his book is addressed to uh, the people in the U.S. Yeah, he's such a well-respected liberal um, scholar that when I was reading that section, I was quite amazed that he got away with all this and that people just are so ignorant. You know, you right now have um, kind of given a synopsis of what happened here in North America with uh, you know, Manifest Destiny and Doctrine of Discovery. But we in the West are so ignorant of what is happening in Palestine and Israel. And we just project all these biblical images. And you know, when you were saying that um, Netanyahu is the new Joshua, it is incredible what we do. 
So, um, you know, I remember when we were there in the conference and you said, oh, there's some Christian Zionists there and we saw them. They are all over um, Jerusalem and Bethlehem and going around. I think some people are confused uh, by what Christian Zionism is, but you did a great job um, in your book. Can you just share a little bit about um, the history of this and why it's so problematic? Because I don't think that many Christians see this as really a big problem that is happening or contributing to actually what is happening in Gaza. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, usually until now, uh, scholars who were addressing uh, the whole issue and notion of Christian Zionism were looking at it as an evangelical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's some people, crazy Christians, who read the Bible literally. <laughs> I say this is a naive understanding of Christian Zionism because Christian Zionism comes in many, uh, um, in many different uh, forms and uh, colors, uh, and we have to look at it differently. I mean, to give you an example, uh, President Biden, when he came a few weeks ago, to visit Israel, uh, you know what he said. Uh, um, uh, he said, you don't need to be Jewish to be Zionist. And I am a Zionist. So, I mean, uh, President Biden is not like the evangelical guy who is taking one verse from the Bible and interpreting it. So what did he mean by I am a Zionist? Um, and so I look at this. Uh, and uh, so I came with a new, if you want, definition of Christian Zionism. Okay. Uh, defining Christian Zionism as the lobby that supports settler colonialism. Uh, and uh, they do that within a meta-narrative. Uh, and the meta-narrative, uh, uh, I, I give three examples. In the meta-narrative, uh, in during the British uh, mandate and before 19th century was the British Empire. So uh, Christian Zionism served uh, the British Empire because they wanted to colonize Palestine they didn't want to do it themselves, but they thought, what if we will become, I mean, it will become, Palestine will become a British colony. Uh, the investments will be put by uh, the, uh, the rich Jewish uh, British people and the cheap labor will be done by the poor uh, Russian Jews uh, whom we don't want in Britain to come to us because they were the pogroms, uh, as you know, in Russia. And everyone wanted to go to, 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 great, uh, to great Britain. And they said, no, 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 we don't want them. These are poor people. Uh, let's send them to Palestine. And to convince them to go to Palestine uh, was, you know, that is the land that God promised you. So you belong there, you don't belong to uh, Britain. Um, so, so, so you have the meta narrative, which is the imperial narrative, and then you have local consideration. In this case, they didn't want the Jews from Russia to come to, to, uh, uh, to uh, England. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that is one, uh, one uh, uh, phenomenon of Christian Zionism. Another one that I tackle uh, is uh, the liberal uh, Christian Zionist. And by the way, I, I consider Walter Brigman a light Christian Zionist because in his book, Chosen, question uh, mark, he shows that actually he is a biblicist. Uh, he connects the biblical Israel with the state of Israel today. 
and this should not be done by uh, any liberal. But you know, we are unfortunately accustomed to have uh, people who are liberal in everything except on Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, 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 uh, in the book, I mention a story by uh, that happens to me by not by Brueggemann, but by another very famous uh, German theologian. Mark Vard is his name, because he wrote also a book about the land. Now he was a socialist, a Christian socialist. Uh, uh, in South Africa, he was clearly against the apartheid. But here, uh, he was a Christian Zionist. And I, I tell the story one day when, when he came uh, to our center, we didn't have the university then, uh, and we had a panel discussion. Uh, he and I, we were sitting on that panel, uh, and there were uh, German uh, theology students who were the, there in the room, and we were debating. And then at one point, he looked at me and said, uh, Reverend Rahib, if I were you, I will back my bag and leave the country because you stand God in the way. This land is not yours. Uh, this land was given by God to the Jewish people. And I said, who is this arrogant German theologian who comes here to tell me, and I'm the native the indigenous people of the land, that I don't belong here. And who, who is he? I mean, who is this guy? who has this kind of hybris that he thinks he's there to divide land and to, I mean, we always say if people, uh, uh, if, you know, you know, they can give one of the states in the US uh, to the Jewish people. Uh, I mean, imagine if, 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 uh, if Muslims will come and say, you know, God gave us, Yes. Uh, the United States, uh, what would you say? Or if, Russia, if the Russian will come uh, to the U.S. and say, you know, in, in our holy book, it says that, uh, you know, the U.S. is our promised land by our God and you should leave or you will be exterminated. I mean, but this is, I mean, this is done by liberal theologians who write books that are sold in the, in the thousand. But again, the meta narrative here was the uh, Holocaust mm -hmm. uh, done by Germans against the Jewish people. And what is the local consideration? Guess what? Mark Wad served in the Hitler army. And so he had that bad conscience and he wanted basically to uh, inject this in us uh, uh, and uh, so that he can feel it's good. Uh, doing good to the Jewish people that he, under Hitler, uh, was uh, actually uh, attacking uh, uh, in concentration. So, so that is another, and then I tell another uh, uh, form, uh, which is the American form, uh, and these are really the, the, the Christian right. These are the evangelical Americans, uh, and for them, the meta narrative it has to do with uh, Christian nationalism. Uh, and uh, for them, they saw in uh, 1967, they started mushrooming. Why? Because America lost the war in Vietnam while Israel won the war in the Middle East. And they were in awe of Israel. Now they might change their mind after this war. Uh, 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 and so that was their uh, Christian nationalism. They wanted uh, the U.S. to become a Christian nation, uh, and they used Israel as the blueprint for what a Christian nation uh, uh, could look like. Uh, but their local consideration were uh, uh, also different because it has to do with, with many of the other issues like abortion and so on that is in their agenda, though this has nothing to do with Israel, but they conf 
uh, flight everything together. Wow, you are so insightful in your analysis. It's so helpful for people who live here in the U.S. And um, you know how you outed all these liberal theologians. You're giving me a lot of courage to do that because I usually don't do that um, in my books or publicly, but you did it so well and you really uh, went down to the nitty gritty. So I, I really appreciated of uh, what you did in the book. So thank you for uh, explaining about Christian Zionism, and you do call it in the book Christian Lobby that supports Jewish settler um, colonialism of Palestine. So I thought that was so important. I hope we can really ingrain that in our minds and in our hearts to really understand this, because that is exactly, if we understand it as a Christian lobby that supports Jewish um, settlerism. And and uh, Grace, you saw them when you came here. You oh, remember yeah, yeah. On yeah. the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives. I mean, these were not people that were taking the Bible and reading every verse. No, no. You know, this was like a, a lobby. Yeah. They were there. Maybe they, they didn't know why they were there and who brought them there. But they were told, you know, uh, you need to go and support uh, this uh, state. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I remember seeing them and you were pointing them out to us. So it was very helpful. I, I just thoroughly enjoyed my time in uh, Bethlehem and traveling around uh, with everyone from the conference. So it was really exciting. But yes, to see them and um, they're coming from all over the world too, um, to Jerusalem to support. Um, so you also write about there are big misconceptions that the West has of Palestinians. Um, and then when I think about 1948, the Nakba, 1948 is actually a significant time globally, because when you go from um, Palestine all the way to Korea, in 1948, it was after the war, after the colonialism of Japanese against um, the Koreans, 1948, it was Russia and US that decided, why don't we divide the country up? So it's interesting how these uh, imperial powers are going around the world and dividing and saying to, okay, Jewish people, you can go and take the land. So I just find that so interesting that it happened at the same time in the different parts of the world, same kind of countries, these imperial powers oppressing other people in such devastating ways. The impact is still, you know, you're feeling the impact. We in Korea are feeling the impact. But can you share a little bit about that and all these misconceptions that we have of yeah. the Palestinians? Yeah, let me first say you are right. I mean, the year 1947-48 was devastating for the whole world because in that year, first of all, uh, the British decided to divide uh, India from Pakistan uh, along the religious line, Hindu versus Muslim. They went to South Africa uh, and they made apartheid illegal. Uh, they created the legal framework for apartheid as an ideology, state ideology, uh, dividing people there according to race, white versus black. In Palestine, uh, they came and divided the country uh, ar uh, along ethnic lines, uh, Arabs versus Jews. Though, uh, what many people don't know actually, that Jews were part of the Palestinian people. Uh, there was no contradiction uh, of being Jewish and Palestinian, exactly like no contradiction between being Christian and Palestinian or Muslim and Palestinian because Judaism was a religion. It's only when uh, Judaism became Zionism, uh, which means a political uh, ideology uh, of settler colonialism, this is when actually the problem started. And then you are right, that year also they divided uh, 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 Korea between North and South, though there were you know, the same people, uh, but uh, uh, the two superpowers uh, wanted to divide uh, that. And I remember my first trip abroad uh, 
I was still in high school and uh, uh, it was with uh, people from Korea oh. uh, and people from Palestine were invited to Germany. Germany was, as you know, also divided. Um, and it was a, a few years later divided. Uh, and uh, yeah, from that day, I, I started uh, feeling uh, with uh, the Korean people because uh, we share the same destiny. Uh, Korea being surrounded by all of these uh, empires. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have the Chinese and yeah. the Japanese. <laughs> Uh, and now many others, uh, you know, the Russian and the Americans. Yeah. So God help you, I mean, and help us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, coming back to who are the Palestinians, you know, the Palestinians are the native people uh, of Palestine. Um, uh, these are uh, the people who uh, stayed there. You know, the poor people uh, stayed in Palestine most of the time. Those who uh, I mean, empires came and to go, went, mm -hmm. but the people of the land, they stayed, though they changed many things. Their identity kept changing, adjusting to the changes in geopolitics. So they were uh, uh, Canaanites, uh, speaking uh, Aramaic, mm -hmm. uh, worshipping the Baal. Uh, many of them stayed like that for uh, millennia. Uh, then uh, some of them uh, started believing in Yahweh, uh, uh, became uh, Jewish, but not in the modern sense of the word. Uh, uh, Palestine was divided, uh, and so those who came under uh, uh, under uh, Assyrian rule became the Samaritans. Uh, they developed uh, their own dialect, uh, their own Bible that is different than the Hebrew Bible, only, uh, uh, only the five books, uh, first five books of Moses. Um, then uh, uh, with, uh, with the time of Jesus, uh, after that, uh, Many became Christians, not all. Um, in the New Testament, we hear about the Canaanite woman. We hear about the Samaritans. Uh, we always think that the land was only inhabited by one group. No, 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 not at all. Throughout the centuries, Palestine was a pluralistic, cosmopolitan a country. Because it is located on a trade road, it was visited uh, by all the regional powers and empires. Uh, they left some of their people in the country and then they had to adjust. Uh, uh, and then Islam came and many uh, converted to Islam. Arabic became our main language. So, but the people stayed, uh, the poor people. And this is why in, in the book uh, on the land, in the chapter on the land, I speak about uh, that verse in the Beatitudes where Jesus is saying, blessed are the meek, mm -hmm. they will inherit the earth, which is nonsense if you think about it. Uh, I mean, how could Jesus say this? Mm -hmm. Was he selling cheap hope to the native people of Palestine? I mean, how could you say that when you live in a, in a, in a context uh, of uh, Roman imperialism, uh, where the Romans were building all of these giant uh, settlements. Uh, think of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, all these, uh, I mean, uh, uh, big cities uh, uh, that they were uh, uh, building. Uh, and, I mean, how could he say that? Uh, and in, in, in another book uh, called Faith in the Face of Empire, I try to look at it a long durée. If you look at it over a long period of time, you see Jesus was right because empires came. The maximum number of years they stayed was 
400 years, the Ottomans. Uh, That's a long time. <laughs> it's a long time. I know it's not during our time that you will see peace. But yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. they uh, they were unfortunately most of the time replaced by the next empire, yeah. not by the local people. That's the but the local people. They stayed. They stayed in the villages. Uh, you know, doing the farming of the land. They were connected to the land, and this is. Uh, how you understand the story of uh, also a uh, Nabut vineyard uh, that Nabut didn't want to uh, the the king uh, to confiscate his land because he said this is the land of my uh, four mothers and forefathers and for me this is not a commodity uh, this is my life. And you know, settler colonial, they look at land as commodity, while the native people, they never do that. I am so glad you said that. Actually, this the interpretation, because that was one of my favorite parts of the book when you were talking about Matthew 5 5. Um, translation is interpretation. So I thought, yes, that is correct, because we have mistranslated uh, exactly what you said about the earth um, and it replacing the land that just brought new thing and then when you were talking about empires come and go that's very true but the how many years did you say was the longest 400 that's <laughs> 400. So the Ottomans were the longest yeah. but that gives me hope you know and so when I read that it gave me so much hope because you know and I was so grateful that you were able to write the foreword to my book hope and disarray and you gave that Palestinian perspective on hope I think that is so beautiful and this whole translation that you gave that translation is interpretation is so important and then going back to what you just said about the indigenous you know the indigenous people don't ruin the land you see that in every part of the world yeah. indigenous palestinians don't want to ruin the land you have taken care you know i i have when i was there i just kept telling everybody the food is phenomenal and, you know, me as a Korean, I love everything spicy. I just love Korean food only. And I wasn't kimchi really... And, uh... the kimchi and... Anything kimchi <laughs> and anything spicy. Sundubu, you know, anything like... I don't eat meat anymore, but anything spicy, I must have. So I wasn't really looking forward to the food. But I tell you, the moment I landed, everything was phenomenal. Everything was so good. Um the tour that we had before the conference, we went to someone's uh, farmland. I think they were growing tr uh, apples, apples and other fruits and honey. Phenomenal food. And it's because the indigenous people, the Palestinians are taking care of the land. You don't see it's only the colonizers that ruin the land. When you build that wall, that is affecting the ecology of the land. Animals can't cross. The water is stopped. The natural things are stopping. For someone to bomb the land in Gaza, it didn't, like that is not only, like the human death toll is outrageous, but what it's doing to the land and to the air and the water, I, Indigenous people don't do that. So I'm so glad you mentioned it because I think sometimes we forget and then we keep saying, you know, the Israelis are the Israelites, as you mentioned earlier, people get so confused. They are indigenous. And even if you're going to track all the way to the biblical times, they're not. So I'm just, you know, your book in so many ways was so important. The way you brought out the Bible and the time of Jesus was incredible so thank you so much for well, doing that welcome, yeah. i mean you know you look at netanyahu uh -huh. uh, he looks like an american oh yeah he, he sounds like an american <laughs> because he's an american <laughs> exactly you know, you know and, we wanted someone you know the older clip with uh joe biden he said if we're israel is if Israel wasn't there, we would have to invent Israel. Invented it, That's yeah. exactly. It is exactly because we need to keep controlling the Arabs and you know the Muslims. It's 
you know, this misconception, it, it is awful. And then when you tie that in with religion, it just gets even worse. And so, you know, sometimes I wake up and I'm just so thankful that you are alive and you are still producing all this literature because we are, we just don't understand. We don't get it. So we need to read Palestinian Christian theological books and biblical books and really dig into it to get a better perspective because we are distorting so much of the Bible. And as you mentioned at the beginning, we're weaponizing it against the Palestinians and against so many other people that we don't want to like. So it's right. awful. Another important part of your book, you talked about the five key stages of the relationship between the Jewish Israeli settler colonial project and the Bible. I don't know if you have time to go all over the five stages, but can you just give a short summary of these five stages between the Jewish Israeli settler colonial project and the Bible? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if if you look uh, uh, if if you look at the last hundred years, uh, what happened in Palestine, uh, and you can see the progression that leads actually to Gaza today, uh, and uh, and it it is an imperial. It started with the British, and now it ends with the Americans. Um, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the ultimate goal in settler colonialism uh, is always actually, and this is what distinguished settler colonialism from neocolonialism. You know, neocolonialism, you go there to colonize a country, but you don't want to stay there. Yeah. Uh, you want just to take the resources to the motherland. In settler colonialism, you go there first of all, to stay, and ultimately to replace the native people so that the native people, they become the savage, the barbarians, the terrorists, the backwards people, which you hear all the time now by, from Netanyahu, if you listen to him. Why to do that? Because that is the reason to exterminate them because they are worth nothing. And this is what you see, unfortunately, in the American media today. You know, I mean, when they talk about Palestinian uh, uh, people that were murdered, you know, they, as if they are nothing, you know. But if, if one Jewish person is killed, oh, you know, the 1,200 Jewish people uh, that were uh, killed on October 7th are worth, 100 million Palestinians. I mean, and that is done only if you demonize uh, the native people, which was done again. It was done in Latin America. Uh, it was done in North America with the native people. It was done in South Africa. It was done in Australia, in Papua New Guinea. I mean, you name it. This is what you do. And to do that, you need to create a security state that actually control every small details of the life of the indigenous, which is what we are living under as Palestinians. And you saw it when you were here. I mean, uh, I couldn't uh, go to Jerusalem. I couldn't go with you to Galilee. And because I'm Palestinian, I'm the native of the land. Uh, while, you know, uh, uh, Netanyahu coming from the US or whatever, they can move freely. So this is uh, this is in a nutshell. I, I don't want to go into all five because that might take. You have to read the book. Yeah. Lots of time, exactly. And you want you to, have to read the book. book. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. And I, you know, I watch a lot of things on social media. And there's one Palestinian TikToker. He said she was kept saying, "Don't talk about it like Ukraine and Russia or um, some other country because that's not the same." Pal um, Israel is on top of Palestine. So because we're thinking it's like two different entities, mm -hmm. they're on top of us and suffocating us. So I thought that was so important for us to kind of get because I think in the West, we're not understanding the settler part of the colonialism. Mm -hmm. exactly, because exactly. we keep saying, 
oh, the Israeli are the Israelites of the Bible. Of course, they're not settling it. It's their land. So we keep talking about it that way. And it, it is difficult. Also in the part of the book, which I found very interesting was when you went in depth about the Temple Mount and about the American or someone who came and talked about the Temple Mount and, you know, tying that in with the agenda of the radical Zionist ideology um, and settlers colonialism. I, if I don't know if you want to share a little bit, people must read your book, but I want you to kind of explain that Temple Mount kind of idea because you went back about who else has been on the land and who is right there, but they're still thinking about Temple Mount. Right, right. Yeah, this is the thing that uh, you see how biblical archaeology also was weaponized against our own people. Uh, and this is uh, this is very clear when it comes to to Al-Aqsa Mosque. I mean, you, you, you know, we stood there, you and I, at uh, um, Mount of Olives, and we looked uh, at, uh, at Al-Aqsa Mosque, at the Dome of the Rock, at the a church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, at the uh, Wailing Wall. Uh, and, you know, what you see there is a Muslim shrine. But theologians and biblical archaeologists are not interested in that. They are interested to dig underground and to see if the temple is there. Now, the temple might have been there, might not. Okay, there is a debate about that. But uh, what does that mean when biblical theologians, and here I'm thinking of the people going to SBL, you know, my fight with the SBL people, uh, when, they, when they keep saying that, this play into the hands of the uh, Jewish settlers who tried several times to blow uh, the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque in the air uh, and to build the third temple. Uh, this is a very dangerous uh, uh, theology uh, because it actually, it has no respect for uh, other religions, uh, uh, for uh, history, and it's only uh, interested in religious nationalism. And religious nationalism, irrespective if it's in Israel, if it's in the States, if it's in Palestine, it is very dangerous uh, 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 ideology. This has nothing to do with our faith. Uh, our faith is not an ideo a, a national ideology. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then when you, I, I love the explanation in the book about, you know, when using the term people of the land or the people of Palestine, um, that, you know, it is an inclusive nature of the people who resided there, irrespective of their religious, ethnic, or national identity. So can you just elaborate a little bit about that? And, you know, you said this inclusive nature of Palestine and its people remained until 1948. And then after that, it just, you know, right. when the name Palestine was re replaced with Israel and then the problem that. So say a little bit about more about that, because I think we in the West are a little confused about this and, you yeah. know, what has happened exactly in 1948 too. Yeah, I mean, again, that is that blur uh, comes from uh, from biblical interpretation, because we think that this land was always inhabited by the Jews. Uh, uh, this is not true. Uh, uh, always, always, throughout centuries, Palestine was a pluralistic. If you talk about the melting pot, the melting pot is not the states, uh, United States. The melting pot is Palestine. This yeah. is why where people from all different you know, ethnic background, religious background, etc. We are coexisting together uh, all the time, uh, and it wasn't a problem to have a multi-faith society throughout se the centuries. I mean, you know, in Europe, uh, Europe was hundred percent Christians for centuries, hundred percent Catholics until 
sometimes in only the 20th century, in the 20th century, say Muslim came, uh, Asian American came, etc. Uh, but before that, it was all like, you know, one religion, uh, one church, uh, no diversity. Now in Asia, and you know it, uh, uh, you know, from Korea better than myself, it's a pluralistic society. You have all of these different, you know, religion and traditions uh, coexisting together, and there is no problem in that. So you come with this mindset and you look at Palestine and you see only Jews. I mean, you know, in the New Testament, there is more talk about the Samaritans than about anything else. I mean, you know, uh, you have the story of the Canaanite woman. You have the story of the Roman uh, uh, soldier, etc. I mean, uh, and this is something that is healthy. This is something that is good, uh, but for a biblical mindset, it does not work because they think uh, monocultural, monolithic uh, at everything they look at. Theology, the, the, the dogmatic Middle Age Christian theology taught them to think that way, and still we uh, did not get rid of that. And I don't understand why, you know, you said, you know, we think that they are native to the land. It's so clear in the Bible that they weren't because they were moving and God told Abraham to go and et cetera. So we know that they were migrating to the land. I don't understand why we keep saying that they're indigenous to the land. And then in the book, in your in your important book, you talk about the oldest name of the land was Canaan. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that name and what that means and how that impacts how we understand uh, Grace, we should leave something for the people to read the book. Okay, so. okay, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so yeah, we'll leave it there because I really want everybody to read it. And Orbis Press, Orbis Books is actually giving 30% off to all the Madan listeners by using discount code MAD. So before we leave, I don't know if you wanted to share any last words of what is happening in Gaza or what you hope that we want to do what you want the West to do or understand that you haven't already shared. And they must read the book too, to get a bigger picture and a bigger idea because your book is very thorough. It's historical, biblical, theological. It, it covers everything. So any other um, things that you want to share before we wrap up? You know, I think when, when I wrote this book and we published it, we were not uh, anticipating that this will happen in Gaza. But I think... Uh, this book uh, uh, hopefully could help people to understand better the background uh, of what's happening in, in Gaza and to see actually why the Bible uh, being weaponized against the people of the land uh, all the time in the media, in churches, by politicians. Uh, and um, we need really to create awareness so uh, because, you know, this weaponization is really causing harm to us. It has prevented us from having our own independence, our own freedom. Uh, and uh, you can see how sometimes the, the West is siding so blindly with Israel based on that. And so we need to be aware of that because only this will change the mindset and hopefully will bring a just peace to our region. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitri Rehab. I hope everyone reads your book. I felt it was so timely. You know, as you said, you weren't, no one, none of us expected this to happen in Gaza, but it is such a helpful book to help us understand what is happening to the Palestinians and to the land. So please order Decolonizing Palestine, the land, the people, and the Bible at orbisbooks.com and use discount code MAD for 30% off. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitri. I know you are so busy organizing and doing so much um, for your people there, but thank you so much for coming on Madame Podcast. Thank you, Grace. It's a pleasure to be uh, on this uh, uh, podcast with you. Thank you. During the season of Advent, the church has long invited us to pray for the coming of God. These prayers 
help us anticipate the celebration of Christ's coming. But that is not all. To learn more, please join Homebrew Christianity's new online class, The Cosmic Christ. This is a pop-up learning community hosted by Drs. Philip Clayton, Diana Butler-Bass, and Trip Fuller. This class will explore the complexity of the Christmas story and the vision of the Cosmic Christ today. This class begins December 4th, so please sign up today at www.tripfuller.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Bright Stars of Bethlehem. Bright Star's mission is to raise awareness and support for Dar al Kalima University, the first and only university of arts and culture in all of Palestine. DAC educates 600 students annually at two campuses, the main campus in Bethlehem and the satellite campus in Gaza. Tourism makes up 70% of Bethlehem's economy, which is currently frozen during the war. This drastically affects the Dar al Kalima University students and their families. Help Bright Stars provide tuition for their 600 students by donating at www.brightstarsbethlehem.com. Orbis Books is happy to sponsor this episode with Dr. Mitri Rahab. Orbis Books is offering a special 30% off Dr. Mitri's book, Decolonizing Palestine to all Madang podcast listeners. Please use discount code M-A-D. Please visit www.orbisbooks.com. One of our wonderful sponsors is Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, a progressive, spiritually-centered servant ministry that seeks to form courageous leaders in the way of Jesus, to cultivate communities of justice, compassion, and hope. Garrett offers degree programs in different areas of church and nonprofit leadership, including a Master of Divinity, Master's Degree in Counseling, Educational Leadership, Public Ministry and Theology, Doctor of Ministry, and a Doctor of Philosophy. If you want to take the next step in your education, you can study in person or online at Garrett. Apply to one of our master degree programs before February 1st, and you could be eligible to receive one of our highest valued scholarship. Visit G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash Madang. That's G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash Madang. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com.